I we'll invite you to open a Bible to John chapter 6. And as we prepare our hearts and minds to hear God's word this morning, we go to Him in prayer. Heavenly Father, we thank You for the gift of Scripture, the gift of Your word that points us to Your Son, our Savior, Jesus Christ. Holy Spirit, we ask that You would speak to us through Your word this morning, that You would give to us encouragement, uplift us in our faith, and illuminate the Scriptures to point us to Jesus, our Savior, even more this morning. As we dive in to hear your word, in your name we pray. Amen. I invite you to open a Bible to John chapter 6. We're going to start at verse 60 from our gospel reading this morning. Jesus is teaching the crowd of the 5,000 who had fed and who had celebrated the miracle and loved him. And as he's been teaching them, they gathered in a synagogue in Capernaum. And he's one of his central points of ministry. And he is now teaching them that he is the true bread of life, that he is the way of salvation. Now, for those of you who are Christians and have been Christian for a long time, that is a simple statement that Jesus is the bread of life and that Jesus is the way to salvation. But for many people, this is a stumbling block. And it was a stumbling block for the people who heard the first time when Jesus said it in the Gospel of John. They did not find it to be a comforting statement. They found it, in fact, to be an insulting and offensive statement. So verse 60 says, When many of his disciples heard it, they said, This is a hard saying. Who can listen to it? The Greek word for hard saying here is skleros, and it means offensive. It doesn't mean that they didn't understand what Jesus was saying. It doesn't mean that they didn't comprehend what Jesus was saying. What it means is that they were offended by it. They are offended by his teaching that he is the bread of life, that he is the way of salvation, and that he is the one who has come from God to bring salvation for all of humanity. Now this is the central teaching of Christianity, that Jesus Christ is the Son of God who has come to redeem the world, and through him you can have salvation. Yet, But like back then, many people still find this statement to be offensive. And even as Christians, we can still struggle with it because we want to save ourselves. We want to be the ones in control of our own destiny. We want to be the ones in control of our lives. We want to be the ones in control of even our salvation. And so we wrestle with this. We struggle with it as human beings because, as Luther said, the natural inclination of the human heart is one of religion. What he meant by that was that the natural tendency of our hearts is to try to save ourselves, to do enough good to earn God's favor, to earn His love so that He will redeem us and save us. And yet when Jesus comes and is teaching that He is the bread of life, that He has come down from heaven as the Son of God, what He's teaching is there is no other way of salvation except through him and that includes you and I saving ourselves through doing good deeds and good works and so there are different ways that we can find this statement offensive we can struggle against it we can wrestle with it because deep down the natural inclination of our hearts is I want to be able to pull myself up by my own strength my own merits and save myself maybe a little help from Jesus but I want to do most of the work myself and what we're going to see in the text as Jesus is teaching, we're going to see two responses. One is to hear the teaching of Jesus and completely abandon him and walk away. See, it wasn't the miracles that got Jesus in trouble. The miracles drew the crowds. What got Jesus in trouble and ultimately led to his death was his teaching that he is the Son of God who has come to save the world and he is the only way of salvation. So one group of people hears this and they walk away, they abandon him. Another group of people hears this, the 12 apostles, and they stay, and through Peter they express a heartfelt confession of faith in Jesus, believing His words. And so my hope and prayer for you this morning as we go through God's Word is that you would respond like Peter, that you would respond like the 12 who believe in Jesus and trust in His words for eternal life. So let's look at the text. Verse 61, after the crowd says, Who can listen to this? But Jesus, knowing in himself that his disciples were grumbling about this, said to them, Do you take offense at this? Then what if you were to see the Son of Man ascending to where he was before? It is the Spirit who gives life. The flesh is no help at all. The words that I have spoken to you are spirit and life. So if you are the kind of person, which is what most human beings are, which is 
Jesus, I believe in you. I love you. But I'm going to do a little bit of the work to save myself. Jesus completely obliterates and destroys that idea. What Jesus is teaching here in verse 63 specifically is that you and I are saved by the work of God, the Holy Spirit, creating faith in us through the grace of Jesus. We are not saved by anything that you and I do. Jesus even says the flesh is no help at all. The flesh refers to this body, this life that I live in my sinful nature, that there is nothing that I can do to earn God's love, earn His favor. It is all the Holy Spirit at work creating faith in me through the Word of God, through the grace of Jesus. So even in our stubbornness, even in our rebellion, even our attitude that says, I can do it myself, Jesus is telling you and me very clearly and very bluntly, no, you cannot. You cannot do anything to save yourself or to redeem yourself. You need the Holy Spirit creating faith through the Word of God by the grace of Jesus to redeem you and save you. It is all the work of the Spirit. It is all the work of faith. It is all the work of Jesus. Nothing that you and I do or add to it or help out with. It is all Jesus. So verse 63 is beautiful if you take it in faith. It is beautiful if you believe the words of Jesus and trust in His grace and His grace alone to save you. But if you don't and you want to say, I'm going to save myself. No, I can do a little bit. I don't like this teaching that Jesus has because I want to do it myself. I shouldn't need anybody's help. Well, then you're going to be like the crowd that takes offense and ultimately walks away. So again, my hope and prayer for you is that you would take the words of Jesus in faith. That you would trust Him when He says, the flesh is no use at all. You say, yeah, you know what, Jesus, you're right. Because I'm a sinner. I'm imperfect. I make mistakes. I do not live the way you want me to live, right? We say in our confession, things that I've done and things that I've left undone. We confess that there are things that we do that are wrong and there are good things that we should be doing that we don't do. And what we confess in confession and absolution is that we need Jesus to forgive us and redeem us for both of those things. Another way of putting it is we're admitting that we are imperfect. And no matter how hard we try, we will never perfect ourselves in this life. No matter how hard we try, we will never live a perfect life. We will never live a perfect week or a perfect day. So in the one hand, this is a difficult teaching because we so desire to show the world, to show ourselves, to show God that we are good and perfect. We have it all together. But the reality of life is that we don't have it all together. We come up short, we make mistakes, we, to use a Bible word, sin. We are imperfect human beings. And this passage is so freeing if you are able to humble yourself and admit you are not perfect. That you cannot do it on your own. That you cannot do it in your own strength. That you and I are weak at times. And you and I will be set free by that confession because we will realize it is the work of the Holy Spirit, it is the work of Jesus that is saving me and redeeming me from my sins and not myself. Jesus goes on to say in verse 64, But there are some of you who do not believe, for Jesus knew from the beginning who those were who did not believe and who it was who would betray Him. And He said, This is why I told you that no one can come to Me unless it is granted by him by the Father. So Jesus says, no one can come to me unless the Father moves him through the power of the Holy Spirit, as the rest of scriptures teach us, that only through the work of God do you and I come to believe in Jesus. That's a difficult teaching, but it's also a freeing teaching. Because again, it is hammering home the point that you and I do not save ourselves. We don't wake up one day and say, today's the day I'm going to be perfect. Today's the day I'm going to do better. Today's the day I'm going to achieve perfection. Today's the day where I'm going to redeem myself. No, we wake up and our natural inclination is to be imperfect, to make mistakes. You might have goals and desires to be better and to do better, but the reality of life is that we do not achieve those goals. We don't meet those goals most of the time. We end up continuing in our imperfection and in our mistakes and in our sin. We need someone outside of ourselves to come and redeem us and rescue us. 
The way the Apostle Paul puts it so bluntly in many of his letters is that you and I are dead in our trespasses. Another way of saying this is we're dead in our imperfection. We're dead in our sins. And here's the harsh reality that Paul is driving home when he says that is that we cannot do anything because dead people don't do anything. Dead people have no life, they have no energy, they have no strength, they have no power, they have nothing. They cannot do anything to raise themselves up and bring themselves into new life. And St. Paul, when he writes that, is saying, that's true of you and me spiritually, that you and I are dead in our sins, and we need someone outside of ourselves, God, to come and raise us up to new life. And Jesus is saying that here in verse 65. He's saying, you can't come to me unless the Father draws you and gives you the ability and brings you to me. What Jesus is saying is, you need the Father to redeem you, to give you the power to believe, to give you the gift of faith. Martin Luther called this an alien righteousness, meaning it's a righteousness outside of ourselves. It's a faith that comes from outside of us, that we don't do the work, but God does the work of grace in our lives and so he makes us righteous he gives us the gift of faith verse 66 we see a response after this many of his disciples turned back and no longer walked with jesus so jesus said to the 12 do you want to go away as well and simon peter answered him lord to whom shall we go you have the words of eternal life and we have come to believe and have come to know that you are the Holy One of God. So Peter gives us the right response. How do we respond to these words and these teachings of Jesus? Well, I want to show you four things that, Jesus, that Peter does to respond to the words and the teachings of Jesus and four, hopefully, encouragements for you that you would say, this is how I want to respond to Jesus in my life when I hear His word. Peter responds first by addressing Jesus as Lord. Lord, to whom shall we go? What Peter is saying is, you are our master. You are our leader. You are the king. You are God. So he's saying that you are unlike anyone else. You're not just a miracle worker. You're not just a good teacher. You are God, Jesus. And that should be our response as Christians as well, to hear the teachings and the words of Jesus and in faith go, you are God, you are unlike any other. There is no one else in all of creation and the whole universe like you, Jesus. Now the other side of calling Jesus Lord is that it means he's in charge of your life. You don't get to tell Jesus what to do. Jesus tells you what to do and how to live and how to follow him. We don't get to pick and select and choose and go, okay, well, I want to do this part, but I don't want to do this part, right? When he tells me, come and rest, I want to do that. When he tells me to go and love people, I don't want to do that because sometimes people are hard to love. Now, when we call Jesus Lord, we're calling him our God and our master. And so we're saying, Jesus, you have complete authority over my life. There's no one else I can turn to to give me life. Number two way that G Peter addresses Jesus, he addresses him as the true interpreter of Scripture. So when Peter says, to whom shall we go? You have the words of eternal life. He's picking up on an earlier teaching of Jesus from John chapter 5, where Jesus said to a group of people, he said, you search the Scriptures because you think that in them you have eternal life, and it is they that bear witness about me. Yet you refuse to come to me that you may have life. You know, I love this book. I love God's Word and I encourage you all the time to open your Word, to read the Word, to be in the Word because Jesus tells us in God's Word that when we read the Scriptures, it points us to Him and through Him, you and I get eternal life. So when Peter looks at Jesus, he addresses him and says, you're the one that teaches us how to read Scriptures. You're the fulfillment of the Scriptures. We can't go anywhere else for eternal life. So when you and I read the Bible, we shouldn't just read the Bible for good advice, for wisdom, for clarity. All those things are good, and God's Word does reveal many of those things to us. But ultimately, the purpose of reading Scripture is to get Jesus. Because when you and I get Jesus, we get good news that we are forgiven and loved and saved by His work on the cross. When you and I get Jesus, we get the gift of eternal life. 
And so Peter teaches us this when his response of, where else could I go to get that? Only Jesus can offer that eternal life to you. And so we want to be in God's Word so we can learn more about who Jesus is and how He saves us through His death and resurrection. The third way that Peter addresses Jesus is that he addresses Him in faith. When he says, We have come to believe and have come to know that you are the Holy One of God. So he's saying, We have come to believe and come to know that you are God. He's saying, We believe in you. We believe who you are and who you say you are. So they hear the teachings of Jesus and they respond in faith that says, Jesus is more than a miracle worker. He's more than a teacher. He is the Holy One of God. He is the one that God has sent to come down to be our rescuer, to be our redeemer, to be our savior. So the way we receive Jesus is we receive him in faith. Another way of saying it is we receive Jesus as he reveals himself in God's word. He reveals himself to be the son of God who has come down from heaven to redeem us and to rescue us and save us. And so like Peter, we join him in saying, we have come to believe this is true of you, Jesus. There is no one else like you. You are the savior. You are the master. You are the Lord. You are the son of God, the holy one. And then finally, Peter addresses Jesus as the holy one of God. He says, we have come to know that you are the Holy One of God. That is Peter saying, you are God. Jesus is a man, but he's also God. He's a miracle worker, but he is God. He is a teacher, but he is God. And so the most important thing to believe about Jesus is that he has revealed himself and shown himself and taught publicly that he is the Son of God. As Peter said, he is the Holy One of God, meaning there is no other way of salvation except through him because he's the one who has come to make salvation possible, to make the gift of eternal life possible for us who believe in him. So my hope and encouragement for you is that you would believe the way Peter believes. That you would believe that Jesus is who he says he is about himself. That you would believe the words of Jesus, receive them in faith, and come to believe and come to know that Jesus is the Holy One of God who loves you, forgives you, and redeems you. Let's pray. Lord Jesus, we give thanks that you have revealed yourself to be the Son of God. You have revealed yourself to be the Holy One of God who has come down to rescue us, redeem us, and save us. May we respond to your word in faith the way Peter did, believing you to be who your word says you are, believing your words and your teachings to be the very words of eternal life. And may we trust in you as the Holy One of God for our salvation alone. In your name we pray. Amen.